Jimmy Wanjeke is a businessman, business mogul. <laughs> is that what they call him? And is now a presidential aspirant with the Safina Party. Jimmy, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Situation Room. Eric Asante Sana, it's good to see all three of you here. Nundu, CT, <laughs> and of course the viewers tuned in. I want to correct you, Eric. I'm a presidential nominee, not aspirant. Nominee? From the Safina Party. Okay. Okay. You become a nominee when the IEBC takes... You, you, that, that's when you become a candidate? No. <laughs> that's when you become a candidate. That's okay. correct. So, presidential nominee for the Safina, Safina Party, uh, Jimmy Wenjeke, thank you for joining us. I noticed that your jacket is actually also written uh, Situation Room SR. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Staying on brand. You understood this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Knowing where you were going. <laughs> Absolutely. We have... Um, Good to be here. W one of our, uh, you know, legends in broadcasting, Jimmy Gathu, will be joining the uh, Spice FM fraternity. He has a show starting this weekend. So, Jimmy Gathu is J I W M I. Jimmy Wenjeki is J I M I. How many times do you have to correct people on the spelling of your name, Jimmy? How many Too many times, y? actually. Too many <laughs> times. Um, and that's been for, actually of late. Uh, as a business man, I didn't have to correct people too much. But as a politician, it seems you want to keep reverting to the old way of writing Jimmy. Mm. Mine was J-I-M-I. I was a great fan of Jimi Hendrix during mm. his days. Mm. And uh, he wrote it as J-I-M-I. And uh, I adopted it at a very early age. Okay. okay. Yes. Is Jimmy short for James? Yes, it is. Okay. If we can make a connection, mm. or maybe now seeing how we're jumping into uh, the realm of politics, James, as one of the only... Uh, one of the disciples of Jesus mm -hmm. is the only disciple is said to have made martyrdom. Yes. And this is recorded. And the uh, reasons as to why that happened are, you know, very, very many. But there are things that he did on earth while being a follower of Jesus that then made sure he got to that point. But it was known by everybody. And it was who he associated himself with and the different things then that he was able to do. Recorded as somebody who made it uh, in terms of that history. What are the things you are doing now that would make it possible or necessary for you to get to that point where you would hold the highest position in the country in terms of leadership that you would be remembered for? I'll be very clear, uh, Nundu. Um, we have been in the political arena for some time now. We have been behind some great leaders and some poor leaders. And we have learned a lot of lessons. We have learned the length and breadth of this nation. We are clear about the challenges the country faces today and the country faces tomorrow. And I can assure you that we have decided uh, and decided long time ago to stick around our necks to create a new paradigm shift, a systemic change to the 60 years you have known Kenya as. And we are prepared to do whatever it takes to change what we are saying. And I am very clear about this. And I was clear in my nomination speech on Monday is an Itweka moment, a break from what we have known as normal Kenya to a Kenya that is normal for 99%, not 1%. So I can assure you we have clear plans and a clear conviction to be the James in the Bible, clearly. Why? You know, there comes a time in a man's life um, that you ask yourself why you are here. You call me a business mogul, business success. Yes, I, I, I have been fairly successful in, um, in attaining uh, a certain level of, of business acumen and success. I accept. I am comfortable. But is my purpose and the blessings that this country and God has given me just for myself and my family? 
I don't believe that's my purpose. I believe that a lot of what I am and have been given in life, by the grace of God, is so that I can do better for mankind. I so that I can impart, um, a, a, you know, some capacities, more capacities, make life better for the majority of those that I have found. And we've grown together. So I am very clear that um, my purpose in life is great purpose in greater than self. You know, you reach a stage where one has to decide uh, on many things. Um, at my age now, you either decide you want to do philanthropy or you want to make um, a big difference um, to your fellow citizens in the world. Mm. And I am at that stage where I've said this time, I think is a revolutionary moment. Um, it's no longer business as usual. It is no longer the politics that we have known. It's actually a fundamental change that needs to happen. This is not new. If you recall uh, the second liberation, you had people who, for example, my own party leader in Safina, who left the comfort of their beautiful air-conditioned offices. He was one of the most successful lawyers. I decided, well, it's all well and good to sit here and practice law. But the rest of the world, called Kenya, does not have uh, human rights, does not have democracy. And they chose to seek out their necks. Kenneth Matiba was a successful CEO hmm. of uh, breweries, chose to come out and serve the people and stuck out his neck to multipartism at the cost of his life. So we have this in history. We have it in history when we had the struggle for independence. People decided that they are going to stick out their necks no matter what it takes. Jomo Kenyatta being one, Dede Nikimathi, and many others, Chengo Neko, they mm. stuck out their necks to make sure that this country had a different trajectory. Mm. So here we are saying after 60 years of independence, it's no longer transactional politics. It's no longer business as usual. It is no longer changing uh, different people and putting them in the same forest. Mm. It is now really resetting what we know as Kenya. Okay. Why do we need to reset it, Jimmy? If the situation as it has been has allowed you to succeed, has allowed you to thrive, like you say, Kenya has given you the blessing, the way it has been, it has allowed you to become who you are today. Why do you need to change it? That is a very self, uh, selfish question. I mean, you ask me, why me? It's not about me. If it's been good for me, it doesn't mean that it's been good for 99% of Kenyans. It's been fair to me. It's been good to me, yes. But not 99% of Kenyans. We don't live in a bubble. We are not living in an island. Everybody is a child of God. My fellow citizens are children of God just like I am. And they deserve just as many chances and opportunities as some of us have had. There's no doubt about it. You cannot grow in an island. I'm a businessman, for example. Since when are you going to grow in your little island? Where is your market? Why do we have a country with such inequality? Huge inequality. What kind of country is that? How do we have a country today where 53 out of every hundred Kenyans cannot put food on the table. Mm -hmm. what, you know, what pride is there in even calling yourself a Kenyan? You see, these are facts. Mm -hmm. the, it's a, the, the pertinent questions that you raised, Jimmy, mm -hmm. and uh, you and I, I think, are contemporaries. Yes. And uh, so the history you understand is similar to the one I would understand. The environment you grew up in is probably the same environment I grew up in, a, a certain type of Kenya at a certain point in time. Now, for the longest time, people knew of your name rather than of who you were. And when you are referred to as a business success, it's because you are known to be not, you're not your average garden variety business success. No, you were the sort of huge business success that one can only hear of. But clearly you had a road to Damascus experience because what you're saying, you're now in the public domain. Before, yeah, people who knew you knew you, but you were not in the public domain. You were private. Now, 
I, I want to understand what it is that made you get to this point where you felt, no, I think I followed this path for the longest time, but um, it's not the only path I can follow. There is something else I can do. What happened? CT, that's a very good question, and I'm glad you've asked it. Mm. The epiphany was 2013. Mm. I had probably one of the most frontline um, political experiences when I helped the Jubilee government, in fact, it was called Uhuruto at the time, get to power. Mm. And um, that epiphany is both spiritual mm. and patriotic. We had come through a debacle of an election in 2007, where we saw 1,400, almost 1,500 people lose their lives mm. out of internal strife. Bloodshed we never thought we would see in this country. We were plagued by a situation of how to solve peace between warring communities, two specifically, in the Rift Valley, um, that had probably about two decades of strife on land issues, but mainly political. And we had the possibility of a generational change from our fathers to our generation. And we thought this is a time that we can tell them, Zungu, in ICC, that we can solve this problem locally. We can deal with this injustice that was caused upon people and bring about peace and lasting peace in this nation. And thirdly, change generation of power. You remember we had a big song called Digital versus analog. We were now getting to the digital generation mm. and uh, we were doing away with analog. This was the greatest opportunity I can tell you uh, I personally had to feel that I, even though I was in the background, was making a great patriotic contribution to this great nation. My disappointment was that once it was successful in terms of uh, Jubilee getting to power, the agenda remained still about themselves, not about the people. And a lot of what some of us had committed, because we had committed greatly as uh, city, um, we stuck out our necks. You know, a lot of this, when I say spiritual, is very deep. Mm. You must remember that there was bloodshed. Mm. And uh, those lives must be atoned for. There must be uh, a modicum of some repentance. Mm. You, you, you have to repent. And you must do good. Not only to those that have gone, but those that you then govern. Mm. I have been proved right. Because I exited because of those disappointments. And it's clear when I say 53 out of every Kenyans are now hungry. This was established within the first four years of that regime. They inherited 38 Kenyans of every, hun of every hundred that could not feed themselves, could, did not, could not find 200 shillings a day. And within four years, we were at 53. So more pain was inflicted, not gain. That is not repenting. We have never heard of the kind of corruption that you've heard over the last few years. I remember our song in 2017. So I can assure you that my journey is part of that conviction that we were supposed to get it right. We were supposed to oil and put some more energy in what had come out as a fairly successful regime of Kibaki. Tweak it. Sort out the kinkses. But get to a stage now where we infuse energy of a new generation and uplift the lives of more and more Kenyans. Not take them backwards. Not become more analog than the analog we used to criticize. And because there was lack of repentance, I said to myself, I'm sorry, I have to walk out. And I have to atone. Because I had a lot of commitment 
in the making of that regime. Not only personal, but spiritual. I think you heard even the deputy president on two occasions now confirm that when that agreement was finally sealed, there were only three people in that room. And up until today, I have the original agreement. And I can tell you, it is more than a written agreement. Now, I'm a Christian, my brother. I'm a man who believes we are here for a purpose, and not our purpose, God's purpose. You don't go offline and get away with it. You don't. So, if you can't do it, some of us say, fine. Then, something is very wrong, fundamentally wrong in this country. What was the content of this agreement that uh, ended up with two of the three people who were present at its uh, signing and structuring going one way and only one third disagreeing? Well, you see, they were the ones who were elected. I was not elected. And um, my, I can tell you about my side of the agreement. Mm. My side of the agreement was that if Kenyans managed to save the two in the People's Court, because we had termed the People's Court the greatest court, away from ICC and any other. And this is the election? This is the election. Mm -hmm. Then the two will make a very clear agreement that they will save the people of this nation. They will uplift the lives of a majority of people of this nation. That was the only commitment on my part. And what was the commitment on their part? That they would atone to that. But they had structural agreements. They had structural in terms of governance, how the government would be shared, what would be the template of governance. We had aspects uh, that I can't talk about here because this was a secret agreement. But the basis was really that you would have a principle shared government that would deliver to the people the covenants of the agreement. Why you're you going to, be, to save Kenyans. Were you to be the business arm of this agreement? No, not at all. The one who would not execute and make sure not that at all. the PPPs not work, the projects that they need to bring about so that uh, more than less than 33% of Kenyans uh, are living in poverty. Are you the one who is going to Eric, Make the I, wheels move. I can assure you, there is nowhere, apart from being a witness to those agreements, did I pen anything for myself, other than what I told you, the spirit of the agreement. Nowhere. I'm a businessman. If the country is growing, I will grow. I don't need any favor of government. That's how it works. The more people that grow, all businesses grow. If you're proactive, if you're in it, you grow. I don't need any favor of government or contract. All I need is a government that is about growth and we will thrive. So why would I pen it? I don't need to pen it. In the last nine years, um, according to even figures released by the president and the presidential delivery unit, the economy has grown to 11 trillion. You know, Eric, I, I don't want to get into that banter. <laughs> I really don't. I, I remember in um, 2017, they told us that they had put all their issues in some bottle and they had an unveiling. And when we questioned one or two things, they even put down the bottle. So really, I don't want to get into that banter. You and I are living in this country. If people feel they have grown, maybe that's their perspective. But in the length and breadth of the country have even seen of late, I think I find majority are crying about no growth, about receding growth, about desperate Kenyans. I'm not hearing any growth. You know why that question has to be asked, Jimmy? It's because now, you're not a private citizen, Jimmy. You are gunning for the highest seat in the land. And if you're gunning for the highest seat in the land and were you to get it, these are some of the issues you're going to have to grapple with. And if we have people who are listening in, they would like to know what you would, what you think about it, what you'd be able to do about it. Because, after all, that's why we elect presidents, so that 
they can spearhead these very things that are supposed to change the lives of the citizens for better. ZT. And and let's continue the conversation after this quick break. It's half past eight. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, The Situation Room on Spice FM, on KTN Home and on YouTube and Facebook. The conversation is also going on on our social media handles at Spice FM KE, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube as well. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back shortly uh, and continue the conversation with Jimmy Wenjege. He is a presidential nominee for the Safina party. He wants to be the next president of Kenya. And that's what we are asking Wenjege's bid. Is this a long-term strategy that he's playing or is he here just to muddy the waters for everybody else? This is the Situation Room. So, Jimmy, when you announced that you'd like to be the next president, you were a member of ODM. That's correct. A life member of ODM. That's correct. And... The fallout with ODM happened soon after the National Delegates Conference. That's correct. And then we saw on the 8th of March, um, you now moving to Safina party. Yes. Did I get the date right? That's it's correct. 8th of March. Why Safina then? Very much um, because of the same principles I was with ODM. Um, it's flag bearers have been part and parcel of the struggle of the second liberation. They have stuck out their necks at a time of great adversity um, to change, um, positively change the history of Kenya. Um, Paul Moite, uh, Leakey, Richard Leakey, the late uh, Richard Leakey, and many others uh, formed Safina on the principles of that. So the ideals that it stands for um, are very much in keeping with very similar ideals that ODM had the pro-democratic ideals. On top of that, um, as you are hearing in what I'm saying earlier, I am very spiritual and um, Safina represents an ark, the ark, Noah's ark, to save the people. It is revolutionary and that is who I am. I am revolutionary. Now, when I say revolutionary, I think it's important to understand that in every revolution, they are what are called three R's. There's rescue, reform, and reposition. Our people in this country need to be rescued. And the symbolism of Safina mm. is very clearly in, 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 in tone with that. Now, I am a big supporter now and the presidential nominee of what Safina has stood for. And we are reviving a party that um, has been there and I'm very clear that we are going to do very, very well this coming election. I'm keen to understand, um, just like you said, when the founders of Safina, Dr. Richard Leakey, Paul mm. Muite, Muturi Kigano, Farah Mahalim and the others were launching this party, they were talking about a party that is going to be different. It's like uh, the third uh, way in terms of politics in the country. And it had a lot of democratic ideals. The last time Safina had a presidential candidate was in 2013 when Paul Moita was vying. Throughout this year and last year, Safina has not talked of fielding a presidential candidate. Enter Jimmy Wenjegi on the 8th of March. Uh, he becomes a party member. 21st of March, barely two weeks later, a special delegates conference is called of the Safina party and the party delegates now say, all right, this new stranger who has just joined our party can carry our party's banner to the national forum. What did you use to convince them? First of all, to even attend this delegates conference and also to give you this great honor of their party. What did I use? Yes. Okay. What, what did, did you, you do? <laughs> how, how, how did you entice them? <laughs> well, I, I, I believe I didn't entice them. I, I approached them to join. And... Um, I think it's public knowledge what I have been stand what I stand for, and um, they accepted my life membership on the basis of what I stand for, how I speak, what I'm talking about, revolution that is in the making. So we had a, co a connection of ideals. Paul Moite is somebody I've known for many many years. I knew him even during the poor democratic period of the Second Liberation. I think it's important you understand, I didn't begin politics now. I have known a lot of these good friends of mine for many, many years. Um, I, I got back from school and um, Ken Matiba 
was in the forefront. He, I used to call him Uncle Ken of the Second Liberation. At that period, that's when I met Raila Odinga. That's when I met Paul Muite, James Orengo, Kitobo Imanyara, many others who have been part and parcel of this struggle. So we know each other. We know each other very well. Um, and it's on the basis of that we have a, a commitment of shared ideals for this nation. So there's nothing to convince. We know each other. So they know the character of the person that they, they were accepting. That's true. But, yes. you know, I'm trying to get into understanding your power of persuasion, Jimmy, that in a couple of days you join a political party, a party that had already, you know, seemed to have decided this particular election we're going to set it out. I don't think they had decided a, that. There were, was there another candidate on no, Monday? They, they may have not mm. had a presidential candidate. Doesn't mean they had not set I mean. it out. Mm. They if had I, decided to sit out the presidential race this year. Uh, no. Not yet decided. No, but there no, was no. no. There was I, no front runner. There no, was no I disagree. other party member. Eric, I completely disagree with you. You will disagree. There was no you. other party member Who that may have interest expressed interest. Doesn't in, mean that they had decided to sit it out. Had somebody else. Uh, let me let me offered. change my words. Yes. I, agree, I agree with you. Let mm. me change my words. Up to the 21st of, up to the 8th yes. of March, no other member of Safina Party had expressed interest in vying for the presidency. Yes. No member of Safina Party had even come together and formed a caucus and said, let's look for someone who can run, who can run on our party ticket. I don't think, they, how, do you, how do you know that? But Eric, how because do you know that? The results show us. Eric, no, you don't Eric. know that. They may have been looking for a candidate. Eric, how will, do you know now, that? Now you remember. You no, can, how do you know that? You remember you can give us the leakage. Uh, no, no, no. The, no, no. the information You're, that is in the public knowledge, that there was no member of Safina Party who had expressed interest and desire to be the presidential candidate for this party. Eric, can you consider another possibility? Uh -huh. You see... Can I finish my question? Yes, Actually, please, Eric, go yes, ahead. Then, then we can it. bring in the, the possibilities. Yes, yes. By the time we're having Jimmy Wanjiki joining the party, uh, not publicly, there's nobody else. And then there's a special delegates conference. And Jimmy Wanjiki is the only one who seeks to contest on this party's ticket. And all the members present then say, that's okay. We agree with what Jibu and Jiggy has brought on board and we want to support him running on our party ticket. That power of, of persuasion is what I'm seeking to understand. Can I then ask, or can I then bring in the perspective that yes. I had in mind? Yes. You're talking about somebody who's been known as a businessman and now has entered politics. The thing that businessmen do better than most people is they, they negotiate. Mm -hmm. And they don't usually tell you everything that they are doing and how they are negotiating or the tactics they're using. Now that he's a politician, fully fledged, he was a politician before, but a background, backroom politician. I would like to ask the question if negotiations had been going on all along. Because if, if you look at how politicians form these coalitions, it's not as though they wake up one morning and they have an epiphany and suddenly they want to join. They've been talking behind the scenes. CT, yes, let me, and, and Eric, let me, let me be categoric. Yes. Even before I had concluded um, uh, with ODM, in other words, when I was chased by ODM, it stones. <laughs> I want to tell you I had very many approaches from different political parties mm. that identified with what I was speaking about, that offered me a chance to run on their, tic on the, on their party tickets. I had very many, but I was a loyal member of ODM. And when that chapter ended, I decided to, 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 to look at the length and breadth, and I chose Safina. You said negotiation? I can assure you the negotiation was on ideals. Mm. It was on ideals, nothing else. Can we look at the optics of this because I think it is oftentimes what plays out then in the minds of Kenyans and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Jimmy Wajige today we could be talking about somebody else tomorrow and unfortunately a lot of times people who look from the bleachers will say that these folks are really not concerned about what happens for Kenyans we're going into an election all the things that have been said all the things that have been promised 
And I, I honestly do believe that in as much as people talk about having a reformist agenda for the country, there needs to be a reformist agenda about the optics and the way this plays out. Because the way in which it presents itself, for those who are on the outside looking in, is that folks are going to use any available vehicle then for personal or political expediency. So how do you have a dismantling of the optics to let the people of Kenya actually know if it is the truth, that folks who are putting themselves up for candidature are really interested in the development of this country and its people? No, 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 that's a fantastic question. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll be very clear with my answer. We have a situation where the political literacy in this country is not what it should be. People have not understood that the length and breadth of their life is politics. So they are into optics and into being put in boxes. We must understand the periods and the challenges and the questions of each and every election we have. That is political literacy. Then you will understand which candidates or who, which, which candidates best suit the challenges of the time. I said, and I'm the one who started this conversation. We've had three, we have the independence liberation that had its heroes and warriors. And that period was from 1963 to 1992, a 30-year period where clearly the foundation of this country was established. You then had the second liberation, 1992-93 up until present, 30 years, 2022. This was now our human rights. We were against our internal colonizers. And we have climaxed it very well in a new constitution and have had two elections since. Now, it has had its heroes and its warriors. These two periods coincide with very interesting periods in world history. The advent of our independence was the beginning of the Cold War. So you can see how it dovetails mm. with what is happening in the world. The advent of our second liberation was the end of the Cold War, where now people feel, hey, maybe we don't need these, let these people now start, because democracy has a way of, you start looking at each other, you don't look at them. Mm. So you find there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, I don't want to call it neocolonialism, but a lot of influence from outside on our politics. Mm -hmm. We are now in what I am de defined very early in my campaign as the third liberation which is the economic. It is now empowerment, what is embodied in our 2010 constitution under Article 43, social and economic power. Now, what is most interesting is what you have just asked. How do we know that it's not sloganeering, it's not this? It's by looking at the candidates. Where have they stood during this period? If you recall just 2017, if you recall 2013, those are two close elections. I said in 2013, we talked about digital versus analog. And we brought in what were being called the digital generation. The founders of that today are supporting analog again. Okay, they've gone back to analog. One of the founders of the digital uh, so-called revolution of 2013 is now supporting analog that he was criticizing mm. not too long ago. Okay? The other party has been part of what we defined in 2017 as the mess to this economy. Because if you define, if you remember, when we were campaigning in NASA in 2017, we defined our opponents as a driver and a conductor. And I think we were fairly clear about what we define them as. Mm. So this is what is carrying. That's why it's, it's got nothing to do with the agenda at hand. They have never carried an economic agenda that has succeeded. Jubilee has failed economically. That's why this is such a big question to this election. We are being told there are certain boxes, but nobody is telling you what this economic revolution means to them. So judge people on ideas. We have clarity of ideas. We have clarity of what this revolution is. It's not sloganeering. I am clearly saying that the last 60 years of our existence here has economically disenfranchised majority of Kenyans. It has been rigged. It's rigged as a system. We adopted a system where the colonialist was the boss. The colonialist, we as Mwanainchi 
served a government rather than a government serving it. Our internal colonizers did the same thing. This is our own people who adopted a system of governance that was about them, not about the people. And now it must change. It must be about the people. And when it's about the people, the game changes. Because then it is service, it is actual empowerment to those people. This is not sloganeering. This is called, this is why I'm saying, this is Itweka. This is a break from what we have known. It is an accountable government system that has changed, that will change completely from what we have known in the past. Mm. Not just musical chairs. Now, that is now when you should ask me. So what is your revolution? What is your economic template? And let us debate ideas. Because I can assure you, many of these people who are talking today don't, cannot debate ideas. Let us debate those ideas. What are the main pillars of the economic revolution that you speak of? I said every revolution has three years. We must first rescue the people because they need to be rescued. We have 5.4 million unemployed Kenyans. Just to start with, that is a social and economic national disaster. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can imagine... Um, how, how, what they are thinking, what they are going through, how they are trying to survive, and and what is happening to their very fabric of dignity if they have any left. Now we must rescue the people, mm. and rescuing the people means that we must uplift their lives. We have a situation in this country where government is now paying seventy five percent of its income to debt, debt we do not understand. So you have a huge deficit funding issue. They are borrowing to feed themselves. We must address the debt problem. And that debt must be first and foremost audited. We must put a freeze and audit this debt. Because mm -hmm. that expenditure, I'm telling you, we cannot breathe. And when we audit this debt, those that pass the audit test, we must look for long-term debt. We must swap this debt. It's the only way we are going to breathe. That's the first thing. Okay, first R. That's the first R. Mm -hmm. And in R, we must also talk about boosting productivity. Right? There are three pillars which we want to move on here. Mm. We are going to boost productivity and growth. We are going to deal with inequalities of income. And we are going to deal with governance and service delivery. Those are the three. And those cut across the three R's. Mm. So when you talk about rescue, you're also going to boost uh, economic growth and activity. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, how do you do that? Look at agriculture, for example. Agriculture today is 35% of the economy of this country, GDP. But it only produces 2% of income. Industry is 8%, but produces 17.5% of revenue to the government. These are, the, these are the disparities, which means that our agriculture is very subsistence. There's no value addition to it. We must now start talking about very serious value addition. I talked about it in the Safina nomination um, uh, NDC. And I said, you imagine the tea that we drink called ketepa is not made, it is, it is, it is grown here, it is primary processed here, but to bring it into that tea bag that we so enjoy, it goes out to Dubai and comes back here. It is not even done here. Neither is any of the tea that is, that, that is produced in this country. This is how sad our value addition is. So we must now start asking ourselves questions as to why there is no value addition in this country for agriculture. We must now start talking about a very different game and be aggressive about it. And in that, mm. we must now look for different markets. I can tell you, there's no reason why Kenya is unable to conquer the one billion sub-Saharan Africans with the products that we have. We have quality. We have capacity. We have work ethic. There's no reason why we cannot expand our markets and in fact conquer these markets that we just have around us here. We are still dealing with traditional markets where we are not gaining here in terms of funding, in terms of money, in terms of growth. Now that 
is jo conjoined in rescue. Mm. You have other elements of rescue, like job creation. You have an EPZ not far from here, Eric. And in that EPZ, okay, you have an Agua Treaty that is 450 billion worth of clothing. Of that 450, it is so sad. Kenya is enjoying only 150 billion because most of those, what is used there is, comes from China. Comes from China. As inputs and machinery. It, not only inputs, yet yeah, most of the inputs, mm. including cotton. I'm glad that uh, the government has given a waiver on BT cotton, which is a GMO, and is now being grown. But it's not even been a very aggressive program. Right? Bangladesh, right? Bangladesh. If you see what Bangladesh is doing out of, out of uh, this apparel sector, mm -hmm. Bangladesh has five to six million jobs in this sector alone. Little Bangladesh. And it has no agreements with Agoa. They've been able to get out into the world. We here have the potential because the apparel industry is about a 1.7, 1.8 trillion world industry. We have the potential on this land to raise our job cassette because this, this 150 is only about 100,000 jobs. Mm. We have the capacity to raise this job market into about a 2-3 million job market just out of apparels if we get it right. BT Cotton. And it's, 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 it's upward uh, trend. Mm. The other is the digital space. The digital arena. If we just made East Africa, a digital hub. A digital hub. The potential of East Africa being a digital hub is nigh, is probably going to be a hub that is the ninth largest in the world. That hub who cre can create opportunities for our very creative young men and women in this part of the world mm. to the extent of about 2 million jobs. Right? Just from their homes, just on their phones they will be able to create that many jobs if we just focus on creating a digital hub. And a lot of this will roll out in our manifesto. So that's rescue. Mm. When you now come to inequalities of income, you cannot tell me we are going to continue living the way we are living with this disparity. That some of us can enjoy a good cup of coffee here, but people do not have food on the table. We must bridge the gap. We must bridge the gap of social mobility. And it starts from a very early stage. Mm. Our children, the last one year, I can tell you because brain development is part of this inequality. Brain development is highest. In fact, is formed between the ages of zero to five. Mm. Two million kids over the last one year were malnourished. So have not had proper brain development. In those years. So you can imagine you've disenfranchised that fellow Kenyan from now until they are a full ad grown adult. Very simple things like community health workers mm. that will go door to door mm. are not being done. You know, Jimmy, Primary health. You know, so we can go on. We're talking about rescue. There, I'm very serious about there, rescue. There are many things. And I think, Jimmy, we'll have you again in the studio so we can, you know, as when you unleash your manifesto particularly, so we can go item by item to look at the how. Um, with the things that you say, this is what we need to do and the how that that needs to be done. We won't need to interrogate that. We thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. I want to give you a moment to say goodbye because we have to say, also say goodbye to the audience on KTN Home. One hour is a short time, is it? <laughs> yes, one hour is a very short time, Eric. Um, I, I'm surprised that it's over. Mm. Um, let, me, let, me, let me be very clear here. Um, this is an Itweka moment. Itweka is a period of saying that this is a time to change what you have known. Mm -hmm. Kenyans, you have known what has been there. The players that have been there have been there all this time. You know the results of, why, of where we are. It's time to change. It's time to do something new. You have all to gain with something new. Don't expect to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Mm. Where we are now is a time to break from the past and allow freshness to seep in our country. And you represent that freshness. Absolutely and completely. 
Jimmy Wenjeke, thank you very much for joining us. Jimmy is the presidential nominee of the Safina party. We've been having a conversation with him about his bid for the presidency, what he, uh, what convinced him to want to join the race and what he wants to do if elected by Kenyans to the presidency. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. We've been live on KTN Home. We're saying goodbye to the audience on KTN Home, but the conversations continue on Spice FM around the country and on Spice FM KE on YouTube and Facebook.